if you forthrightly pursue that which God directs you to pursue, let's say, that all things are possible. That's, that's the idea in the narrative. And, you know, you, you might say that's naive. And, you know, it, it's not. It, you think it when you're naive, right? And then you dispense with that idea. And then when you stop being the sort of person who dispenses with ideas, then you come to another place. And that's the place where you think, you have no idea what might be possible for you if you, if you got things together and pursued what you should pursue. You don't know how much what's impossible to you right now would become possible under those conditions. It's an unknown phenomena. And like, I've watched people who've put themselves together across time, you know, incrementally and continually, and they become capable of things that are jaw, not only jaw-droppingly amazing, but also sometimes metaphysically impossible to understand. And so we don't know the limits of human endeavor. We truly don't. And it, it, it's premature to put a cap on what it is that we are, what, that we're, what it is that we're capable of. And so, you, you know, you're already something, and maybe you're not so bad in your current configuration. But you might wonder if you did nothing for the next 30 years except put yourself together, just exactly what would you be able to do? And you might think, well, that's worth finding out. But of course, that's, that's the adoption of responsibility. And one thing I've also learned over the years, because I've been curious about this battle between meaning and nihilism, you know, and I mean, I mean, I could see for a long while the rationale in nihilism and, and the power of the nihilistic argument, but it, 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 it occurred to me across time that despite that the power of the nihilistic argument is more powerful than naive optimism, but it's not more powerful than the optimism that is not naive. Because the optimism that is not naive says it's self-evident that the world is a place of suffering and that there are things to be done about that. And it's self-evident that people are flawed and that there's things to be done about that. And then the non-naive optimist says the suffering could be reduced and the insufficiency could be overcome if people oriented themselves properly and did what they were capable of doing. And I do not believe that that's deniable. I, I, do, I, do, I think that human potential is virtually limitless and that there's nothing perhaps that's beyond our grasp if we're careful as individuals and as a society. And so I think that there's no reason for nihilism and there's no reason for hopelessness and, and there's no reason to bow down before evil because we're capable of so much more. And I think that you can easily, you know that first because you're not happy with who you are and you're ashamed and embarrassed about it as you should be. And you know it because if you look out there, you see people who are capable of doing great things. And you know that we're not giving it our all. And still we're not doing so badly, you know? And so you, you might wonder if, if, if we devoted 90% of our effort to putting things right instead of 55% of our effort, or maybe even less than that, you might wonder just how well could things be put together? And I think that you can figure that out by starting with your room, by the way. <laughs> Go somewhere you don't understand. That's the first thing, get thee out of thy country. You know, back in the 1920s, there was a whole slew of American writers who ended up as expatriates in Paris, Hemingway among them, and, uh, the, and who wrote The Great Gatsby. Fitzgerald, yes, and, and a variety of others. It was very inexpensive in Paris at the time, and part of their transformation into great literary figures was the fact that they were out of their country, and now they could see what their country was, because you can't see what your country is until you leave it. So you have to go into the unknown, and that's, that's God's first command. Go into the unknown, because you already know what you know. And so, and that's not enough, unless you think you're enough. And if you're not enough, and you don't think you're enough, then you have to go where you haven't been. And so that's the first commandment to Abraham. It's like, okay, that, that's a good one. That makes perfect sense. Go to where you don't know. Yes. And from thy kindred. Well, that, what does that mean? It means grow up, right? That's what it means. It means get away from your family enough so that you can establish your independence. And that isn't because there's something wrong with your family, although perhaps there is, you know, as there is perhaps wrong with you. But it means get away. You know, I talk to people very frequently whose families have provided them with too much protection. And they know it themselves. And that means they're deprived of necessity. You know, one of the things that you see in, in, in the United States, for example, is that um, the children of first-generation immigrants often do better than, the chil than, the, than their children. And the reason for that is that the children of first-generation immig immigrants have necessity driving them. 
and you don't know how much you need necessity to drive you because maybe you're not very disciplined and if and a catastrophe doesn't immediately befall you if you don't act forthrightly today, then maybe you never act forthrightly, right? Because the, the, the gap between your foolishness and the punishment is, is lengthened by your unearned wealth, and so you never grow up and learn, and you have to get yourself away from your dependency in order to allow necessity to drive you forward. And that's to become independent and to become mature. And I think part of what's happening in our culture is that the... The, the force that's attacking the, the forthright movement forward of young men in particular is afraid of the power of men because it's confused about the distinction between power and authority and competence. Like, an, a man who's, who has authority and competence has power as a byproduct, but the authority and competence is everything. And, and, and people who can't understand that fail to make the distinction between power and authority of competence, and they're afraid of power, and so they destroy authority and competence. And that's a terrible thing, because we need authority and competence. What else is going to, what else is going to allow us to prevail in the long run? And so you get away from your country, and you get away from your kin, and from your father's house, right? And you go out there and you establish yourself in the world. It's a call to adventure. That's what this, the, the first lines in Ab the Abrahamic story is a call to adventure. So, great, unto a land that I will show you. We know what's wrong with life. It's rife with suffering and insufficiency and deception and evil. It's all of that, obviously. Okay, what would make the journey worthwhile? Well, you can ask yourself that. It's like, all right, in order to bear up under this load, what is it that I would need to be striving to attain? And if you ask yourself that, that's to knock and, and the door will open. That's what that means. If you ask yourself that, then you will find an answer and you'll think, you'll shrink away from it. You'll think, well, there's no way I could do that. It's like, well, you don't know what you could do. You don't know what's possible. And you're not as much as you could be. And so God only knows what you could, what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. And that's the reason Abraham is constantly making sacrifices. And it's archaic, right? He's burning up like baby lambs, but like, well, they're alive. You know, that's something. And, and they're valuable and that's something. It's, you have to admit, even if you think about it as a modern person, that the act of sacrificing something might have some dramatic compulsion to it. You know, to go out into a flock and to take something that's newborn and to cut its throat and to bleed it and to burn it might be a way of indicating to yourself that you're actually serious about something. And it isn't so obvious that we have rituals of seriousness like that now. And so it's not so obvious that we're actually serious about anything. And so maybe that's not such a good thing. And so maybe we shouldn't be thinking that these people were so archaic and primitive and superstitious. It's possible that they knew something that we don't. And certainly in the Abrahamic stories, one of the things that maintains Abraham's covenant with God is his continual willingness to sacrifice. And it's so, that sacrificial issue is so important because you are not committed to something unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Commitment and sacrifice are the same thing. And I think it's, it borders on miraculous that those concepts are embedded into this narrative at the level of dramatic action. You know, instead of abstract explanation, people are acting this out. And, and, the, and the fundamental conception is so profound that it's really quite, it's quite awe-inspiring. It's, it's breathtaking, really, when you understand what message is trying to be conveyed. You have to make sacrifices. And what do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you. So, well, so you move from the unbearable present to the ideal future, and, and you can't help that. You have to live in a structure like that. That's your house. That's another way of thinking about it. And if you want to get your house in order, and if you want it to be a place that you can live properly, then you have to plan the future that is perfect.